Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 25th, 2019, and my guest is author and economist Emily Oster of Brown University. This is her third appearance on Econ Talk. She was here last in 2014 talking about infant mortality. And before that, we talked about her book, Expecting Better. Today, we're talking about her new book, Crib Sheet, a data driven guide to better, more relaxed parenting from birth to preschool. Emily, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me again. Your book has a phenomenal title, Crib Sheet is Genius, uh, but the content is also superb. It is such a sensible book and as helpful as it will be to mothers dealing with issues such as breastfeeding, postpartum depression. It might be even better for new fathers to read because they will, they will often struggle, at least in my experience, to understand the physical and emotional challenges of childbirth and its aftermath. And you deal with those in a totally straightforward and illuminating uh, manner. I want to start with with the issue of breastfeeding versus formula. Came up recently in an episode with Amy Tutur. Uh, your book is data driven. Uh, what do we know about this this choice? What are the what are the studies and what is the evidence such that it is on this question that is that's very uh, important to every every new family. So. The thing that's, I should just start by saying what's hard about studying breastfeeding, which is that uh, you many of the outcomes we want to look at, things like, you know, is breastfeeding important for kids' health or is breastfeeding important for how kids do in school? All of those outcomes are also linked with all kinds of other things about families. So, you know, for example, moms with more education uh, tend to have kids who have uh, who do better in school. That's just something we know from from other data. It is also the case that moms who breastfeed tend to be different than those who don't. And in particular, they tend to be more educated. They tend to be richer. They tend to have more stable family structures in the United uh, States. In the United States, absolutely. And that's actually, there's sort of some interesting dynamics that's actually become much more true over time since the 1970s when there was a sort of resurgence in breastfeeding in general. And the resurgence was much larger among sort of some kinds of women than others. But, you know, whatever the reason, when you then go to try to look at the relationship between breastfeeding and outcomes, if you just do what we think of as sort of the simplest thing, like compare the kids of women who breastfeed to the kids who, who of women who do not, uh, maybe some of what you're picking up is the impact of breastfeeding, but so much of what's driving differences between those kids are other things about their families. And so when we sort of step back and try to say, okay, let's, let's really understand which of these links are true, it's actually very hard to use these kind of basic, what we'd call observational studies, where they just compare kids who's, who are breastfed to kids who are not, because there are so many biases uh, in those studies. And so, so when I look at this, I really try to drill into studies that are, are what I would say better or more making more convincing causal claim. And there's kind of two kinds of studies that I think are, are more compelling. So, so one uh, are studies are randomized controlled trials. And unfortunately, there is one of those. It's a small um, number. It's a small number. It is a big study. Bigger than which zero. Is, it's bigger than zero. And the study itself is is big. Um, and it was run in the 90s in Belarus. I mean, there are some things about the study that are not ideal. Uh, but it did do sort of some of what we would like, which is encourage some women to breastfeed and some women didn't get that encouragement. And indeed, there were differences in breastfeeding rates in the two groups. And you can then you know, compare their kids and try to draw causal conclusions. The other kinds of studies that I like a lot are sibling studies where they compare two siblings, two kids born to the same mom, where one kid was breastfed and one kid uh, was not. And that is going to address at least some of the kinds of biases that that we worry about because the moms are the same. It's the same mom. Um, so things like, oh, I'm worried the moms are different. That will obviously not be a concern in a sibling study. When you focus on those kind of studies, you find much, much, much more muted 
benefits than the sort of grandiose claims that are made in a lot of the public discussion of breastfeeding. So it is true. It looks like there are some early life benefits, particularly around um, digestion. So it looks like kids who are breastfed are a bit less likely to get sort of gastrointestinal diseases in the first you know, few months, uh, in the first year, and and maybe a bit less likely to have kind of rashes in the first year. So these effects are, are what, they're significant. They're not enormous. Um, significant, they're, meaning statistically significant. They're, yeah, they're statistically significant, um, but they're not, they're not especially large. And these are these are pretty minor, for the most part, pretty minor complications. Um, what these studies don't find support for are things like impacts of breastfeeding on IQ, impacts of breastfeeding on obesity, impacts of, you know, among the kids later, impacts of breastfeeding on um, on eczema or allergies in, in the long run. So many of these kind of claims that are that are made just do not have support when we look at the best data. And so I think what I try to do in the book is sort of drill into those and help people understand, you know, why might you have thought there were these these other links and why is that evidence not as good as the as the sibling evidence or the randomized evidence and, you know, what what can we really learn about these? What can we really know about these impacts? You write about it really extremely well. I was going to say for an economist, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, damning you with faint praise, but you write about them extremely well, period, meaning you make it understandable to a non-economist why these – interpreting these data or, and these studies are, are a little bit challenging. I want to make one point about the sibling study that, that you raised, and that was uh, – I would just mention in passing, that was the the study that uh, Amy Tutur leaned on in her defense of, of not breastfeeding because the sibling study finds very small effects. Um, you point out correctly, though, in your in your book that – one has to ask why one sibling might be breastfed and not another. Uh, it is it is true that the mother's held constant in those situations, but what's not held constant, it's not random. They don't tell a mom, oh, why don't you breastfeed one of the kids and not the other, and then we'll do a study later. <laughs> we don't know the reason, and that could have an effect. So it's just worth mentioning. Yeah, I agree, and I think that you know we always want to be in, interrogating all the kinds of studies that, that we have, and there I think it's often worth thinking about – what are the likely, um, what are what are the likely biases? Like, what are some of the reasons why you might breastfeed one kid and not and not the other? And I think that um, that some of those are situational. Maybe some of those are about the kids. So I think it is worth giving some giving some thought to that. One of the the sort of kinds of studies that that I like here are ones where they sort of use the siblings and they do the kind of biased, what we'd say like the biased regression with the same kids. So they compare the siblings without holding the mom constant, and then they compare the siblings while holding the mom constant. And that is kind of a nice way to illustrate sort of what happens as you include this control and kind of what happens to the bias. I think those are good for illustrating some of these, some of these problems. Yeah, the power of mom. Very, exactly. Very, very large. Yeah, very uh, big. <laughs> would you reflect, um, you don't talk about, you talk about this a little in the book, uh, but I'd like like you to reflect on here as well, uh, the cultural uh, bias, if any, in favor or, or against uh, breastfeeding and the challenges of breastfeeding. I think for those of us who are men or women who have not had children, we just assume it's, quote, easy. It's There's hardly anything you could imagine that's more natural, uh, and yet it's not so straightforward. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So if I think that one of the things that makes this conversation so fraught and uncomfortable in some ways is that is that people, again, sort of assume it's very easy. So it's like, well, even if there's just some small benefit of it, why wouldn't you why wouldn't you do it it's so easy? And if, on the other hand, actually, it is not that easy for for a lot of women. And so I think many, many women, I mean, I certainly did, I think almost everybody struggles with breastfeeding at the beginning. It's actually kind of hard to figure out how how to do it. Um, your baby has never done it before because they've just been born. And so they're kind of figuring it out, particularly if you're a first time mom, you're figuring it out. And you you're you're very, people are often quite delicate with their baby, but it turns out you kind of have to like jam it, jam it on there. And that it's just like, it's hard, it's hard. And then people's milk doesn't come in. And, and I think this adds, there's this sort of societal pressure around breastfeeding. People say, well, don't you want to give your kid the best start? This is the best start. 
It's very important. It's the best start. And I think that that kind of wraps up with this difficulty. It's like, here's this thing. It's the best start. It's the first thing I can do for my baby. And I'm failing them. I'm just, I'm a huge failure. And I think that that is such a hard thing. There's such a lot of pressure to put on moms in these very first moments of, of life. And so I think some of, some of what I want to do with this discussion of breastfeeding in the book is to just take a little bit of that off and say, hey, you know, yeah, like this could be great. And a lot of people really like to do it. And, you know, by the way, there's a whole other chapter in the book about how you can make it work and, you know, what are some tips for making it work better. But, you know, if it if it doesn't work and it doesn't work for you, it isn't the thing that's going to make your kid the, the successful, a successful adult. I mean, there's no thing like that, but this isn't, this isn't it, even if there was one. And so just to sort of take a little bit of that off and tell people, you know, it's, it's okay. You're not failing. You're, you know, you're not failing. You're not a, you're not a bad mom three minutes in. If it doesn't, your baby doesn't immediately crawl up your belly and start nursing. That is not the thing that's going to make you a good parent or a good mom. Yeah. Well, fortunately, Women aren't very emotional at that time. And no, exactly. So it it's a very calm easy time. come, easy go. Very um, calm time. I, I, I mentioned that as I made that remark, I realized that how um, politically incorrect that statement sounded. Uh, but I do want to mention that postpartum depression, which which you talk about in the book in, in some detail and share some very uh, powerful personal stories of your own, it's it's something that it's just a phrase: postpartum depression. And for new fathers, they're just clueless. And I'm sure most women, of course, are unprepared for it as well. But but when you see that your wife is not the person that you know, which they struggle to be in the first days, sometimes longer after childbirth, um, bursting into tears uncontrollably over things that you can't understand, uh, it's really important for, for men to understand that. It's good for women too, but – but men have zero idea what's going on, I suspect, in many situations like that. And it's good to be aware uh, of that. And your book does a really good job. Yeah. And I think it's important also to sort of distinguish between sort of postpartum depression and this sort of hormonal insanity almost of the, not that the woman's insane, it's the hormones uh, of the, the sort of first few days. So I think almost all women in the first days after birth are very emotional. I mean, things you just would just kind of cry just like for no, for no reason. And I think that, and that's like super common and not, it, it, not that it's not something to be worried about, but it's sort of not something to, to like overreact to. But as you know, if that sort of continues and people don't have interest in, in the baby in particular, that's, then we're sort of moving into, into postpartum depression. But I think that it can be very hard. Many women say sort of experience more significant postpartum depression say, you know, that they, it was, it's so hard to see from the inside because when you are struggling with depression, postpartum or otherwise, you know, it's, it's sort of, things are, you're not seeing it from the outside and saying, oh, well, it's just because of, of depression that I, that I feel this way. And so I think in, in part, that is why, if anything, if, if you were going to, if I was going to tell, you know, people, the, the non-birth parent spouse to read anything in the book, it would be that chapter, because I think being able to see some of those, some of those things and recognize them um, could be, you know, really valuable for a lot of, for a lot of families. Yeah. And the, the, uh, I guess the more the gentler phrase is baby blues, short of depression. But as you point out, it's just an emotional time and there's often a lot of crying and it's not, yeah. it's not, it's totally normal. But if you're not prepared for it, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah, it's very hard. Um, one of the things that I love about the book, because I'm an economist, uh, is that you focus on trade-offs. In many of the situations you talk about, the evidence is either weak or suggestive. It's often not definitive. And there's going to be trade-offs and things to deal with and choices. So in this case between breastfeeding and formula, I think a lot of people, as you say, say, well, there's no harm in, in breastfeeding and it has some small benefit at least, if may, maybe larger. Uh, but you point out there's there's cost to breastfeeding, just like there are cost to formula, but they're very different natures and each person has to make their own choice. And your general philosophy in the book is to respect the choices people make. Yeah, and I think in some ways that's very different than than the the first than my first book, than expecting better, where a lot of what I was writing about were things like, you know, is it okay to have sushi? Yes. 
and they're sort of like the the process of the book was like telling people, look, here, this is okay to do, and and here is why. In you know, in at least some of the situations, and I think there's many more things in parenting where you know, of which breastfeeding is one where it's like, yeah, so there's some, you know, there's some small benefits or maybe some, some small costs. And, but so much more important than that is thinking, structuring the decision in a way that, that takes seriously these costs and benefits, but also thinks about the preferences of the parents, what works for, for your family. Um, and, and I think th- that is sometimes missed in some of these discussions of of babies that there's so much emphasis put on uh, on investing in the in the kid and thinking about what is right for the kid at at infinite cost sometimes it seems like to the to the family and sort of I, I would encourage I think part of what I'm hoping here is that people will be encouraged to, to think about some of these choices and how they impact the family more broadly, not just the baby. Yeah, the challenge of course is that if you're miserable, um, you're not going to be the best parent you can be. And so yeah. there is some trade-off between misery and uh, and being a good parent. Yeah, yeah. And I hear I hear often from so, you know, people send me send me emails sometimes and uh, and the the ones that I that I get that I just wish I could sort of reach through the computer mm-hmm. are when people are like, you know, my I'm writing this because my wife, like we have a four week old and my wife is like trying to breastfeed all the time and it's going really badly and I feel so terrible for her and I don't know how I can I can help. And if only I could tell her that like this wasn't the most important thing that she could ever do and that it was going to be OK if she didn't do it, like I think that would really help. And those are the times I want to be like, OK, you know, you we have to we have to help people you know, see, see the reality here. Let's talk about co-sleeping. Um, what is it and what do we know about it? So co-sleeping refers to the practice of having your baby sleep in the bed with you. Um, and this is uh, another very controversial uh, parenting practice um, where I think you get sort of very high emotions on on both sides. So sort of on on the one side, um, sleeping in the bed with your baby is not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. They are concerned about um, a higher risk of sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, um, or suffocation under a sleeping parent. Um, so their sort of party line from the AAP is that you should not co-sleep with your kid. Uh, the On the sort of flip side, the a group that it's broader, but let's say the like attachment parenting space is says, you know, this is the natural way to sleep with your kid. And it's, this is the way people have done it for, for millennia. And, you know, it's totally fine. And the AAP is, you know, overstating the risks and they don't really know anything about, about data. And you, you sort of see both sides kind of really, really dig in, uh, dig in here. And I think, I think part of it is, you know, this is an experience that, that people really care about. Um, it's, it's a lot of the time with your kid. Um, and so I think, you know, in the, the truth lies sort of somewhere in the, like breastfeeding somewhere in the middle of those, of those two extremes. Um, so, uh, so co-sleeping, uh, can be very risky. And in particular, if you are, uh, if you are, the parents are smoking, uh, or drinking, it is very dangerous to to co sleep. Um, smoking increases risks of SIDS for other reasons. Uh, parents who are drinking heavily um, are sleeping more heavily and less likely to notice if they're on lying on a baby. Unfortunately, so when we look at data on this, the the evidence suggests that that combination, that sort of drinking and smoking and co sleeping together, is a very dangerous uh, combination. But when you look at parents who do the co-sleeping in what we'd say is sort of the safest way, so with parents who are not smoking, who are not drinking in a bed without any extra pillows and and so on, um, the, you know there are some risks. There are some increases in in death rates, but they're very small. And you know I think part of what makes this very hard to think about is you know th- this is of course the the worst outcome you could imagine as as a parent. Uh, on the other hand, this is the choice that we have to make. And by not acknowledging the choice, by saying sort of, okay, well, actually, um, I'm not even going to think about this as a as a possibility. I think we're we're not we're not forcing ourselves to to think about the decision correctly. Uh, and so, you know, if if you choose to co sleep, you do it as safely as possible. The risk is 
is there, but it's very small and it's small in comparison to risks that people are taking every day, like putting their kid in the car. Uh, so I can see why people would choose would choose to do this. I can see why people would choose uh, would choose not to. And I think in in sort of both cases, we really want to be making those choices with a full understanding of uh, of what the actual risks are and also how to mitigate them. And as you point out, uh, sleep training, which is a big challenge for new parents and actually any kind of parent because kids aren't the same. It's not always, unfortunately, you can't always take the lessons from the first kid and apply them to the second kid. It's kind of like um, a little bit of a Groundhog Day thing going on there. Um, what are the challenges of, of, of a newborn is they cry a lot. Some sleep through the night. Most of them don't. You get cranky trying to deal with it. You don't sleep so well. You're not the best parent as a result. And co-sleeping tends to, in in some people's experience, leads to better, better parents and better better kids at least for a while. Uh, and that's just that kind of trade-off again, against the very small risk that you talked about, it is a normal thing to think about. It's not, it's not nothing's right or wrong there. Yeah, and I think that you know it's it's just in these conversations somehow we get into these into these discussions where it seems like like people just want you just want to convince other people that the choices they are making are the right ones for everyone. So if you choose to co-sleep, there's somehow then the instinct to be like, well, everyone should co-sleep because it's the right choice because I would only make the right choice. Yeah. And I think one of the things I say a lot in the book was like, is, you know, you, something can be the right choice for, for you and not the right choice for other people. And so we can all see the same data and make different choices and they can all be the correct choice. And so I think some, sometimes we really need to step back. And I mean, I, I'm like the bossiest person on the planet earth. And so I'm always thinking that I should be bossing people to tell them the things that they should, they should do with their, with their kids. But actually when I wrote this book, I tried to step out like, okay, actually, you know, like different, this is maybe not, not the place we should be as the bossiest. And we had Sebastian Younger on the program and in his book, Tribes, Tribe, excuse me. He talks about, um, he talks very powerfully about about the virtues of co sleeping. He says, you know, throughout human history, uh, through ancient times, we never put kids in their own room. We were all in the same cave or the same uh, hut or wherever we were in, and uh, it seems somehow cruel to put kids in their own to exile them to a different tent <laughs> and. He actually makes the suggestion, I don't know if it's his or from somewhere else, that the reason kids become so attached to their teddy bear or their blankie or whatever it is in their bed is that they're desperately lonely and they turn to whatever they can for comfort that is in the bed when it's not apparent. And I found that poetic and interesting. Um, I don't know if it's true, and I think you would concede we don't know whether it's true either. Nope. It's a tough thing to test. <laughs> I agree. I mean, yeah, we don't like, I guess that could be, I guess that could be true. I'm not sure what we would, I think there's, I have sort of two reactions. One is I'm not sure what we would, what we would do with that. Um, because, you know, I don't know what are like, what are the outcomes, the sort of long-term outcomes that we're thinking about there that we would be interested in evaluating. So if, if the, the thing we're concerned about is loving the teddy bear, that's obviously itself like not a big deal. I understand that there's some deeper thing about not being able to form attachments to other, to other people maybe, but I'd want to be a little more specific about kind of what are the, what are the downsides we're seeing? And the other piece there, and I, you see this, you do see this a lot in this co-sleeping discussion um, and in attachment parenting more broadly about the idea that, um, that, you know, this is how it was always, this is how it was always done. I mean, there are a lot of things that are different uh, about uh, modern society than um, when people were living in one cave together. And so I'm like, on the one hand, you know, I, I kind of see the point on the other hand, I, I am I am not sure where where to take that argument and and the kinds of skills that people need are different from when we were living in caves. So I, I I'm I find that interesting I guess but I'm not sure it's so relevant to uh, to the kind of parenting people are doing uh, people are doing these days. Which isn't to say that again, which isn't to say that you shouldn't co sleep with your kid if that is something that you uh, that you like. I mean, for some people, this is like a great 
experience. They love having their kids in, in their bed and they like to have their kids in their bed until they're old. And it's, you know, if you don't get to see your kids much during the day, it's like nice to see them, to see them at night. I think the thing that, you know, some people don't like that though. I think we have to acknowledge, like some people do not want their children in their, in their bed. Um, well, going back to the Sebastian Younger point, uh, it's possible through most of human history, drunk, exhausted parents after a day of foraging and hunting rolled over on their kids and killed them a lot. So it's not a, it's not, there's a lot of romance to that story. I, it happens to appeal to me. Uh, we were not religious about co-sleeping. Or most of our kids slept in their own beds. They were allowed to come in in the morning, and and they may have stayed at night for a while. But uh, I, I do understand the appeal of that. Um, Amy Tutor calls it a paleo fantasy. I don't know if that's that kind of thing she calls that. I don't know if that's um, – there's no way of knowing. It's um, I think just an important uh, aspect of life that I'm increasingly – interested in your book makes me think about that a lot of things we want data on we don't have and we just have to deal with that it's just the yeah. way it is yeah you have to make these choices with limited with limited information you're going to have to choose whether to have your kid in your bed or not in your bed those are only two things you can only have them in one of the two places and you are not going to have unlimited amounts of perfect data to evaluate the full consequences of that but you still need to make the you still need to make the choice and that's true of so many things in parenting and also in all other parts of your of your life i don't know if it's uh if you remember it off off the top of your head but there's a beautiful story telling the book about your daughter's reaction to your son struggling to to fall asleep uh when you and your husband are dealing with this challenge with your second child and You'd already gone through it with the first child. Of course, sometimes that brings back tough memories, and it's very, very hard for many parents, most almost all parents, to hear their kids cry. You know, you come back from the hospital, and it's like, what do we do? How do we get into this? What? <laughs> it's hard to get out of the car when you come back from yeah. the hospital. It's like no manual. Parents aren't here, uh, and they're crying, and it breaks your heart. You just – you're, it's designed to break your heart. It's very effective. Uh, or maybe design's not necessarily the right word, but it breaks your heart. Um, do you remember what, what your daughter said when – Yeah. When yeah. So this is when we were we were sleep training, Finn. And as you say, I think when, when you're you know when you sleep training your kids, it is very it is very hard to hear them to hear them cry. Um, but, you know, we, it was the right – it was the right choice for us. But, and we had done it with, with Penelope. And at this point, she was, you know, four and a half or something. And so I was, you know, kind of upset. And we could sort of hear him crying from her room. We were doing bedtime. And she says, Mom you – know, as, as I'm kind of upset. And Jesse said, you know, your mom's upset because they're crying. And, and Penelope said, Mom – we we have to help Finn learn to sleep. Like it's important that you that you do this. Yeah, and she was very serious about it. I mean, she she continues to have a lot of opinions about child rearing with her brother. Uh, <laughs> no doubt. And you know, but it was it was of course in that moment you're like, okay, well, like I I guess it's maybe it's gonna be okay because it was okay with the with the first kid. And I think in some sense that's that's really like the realm of it's the realm of anecdote. You know, she sure. You know, but. But for me, like that, you know, even though I had I had made the choice to do sleep training based on data and and evidence, still in that moment, it was very nice to sort of get the the anecdote uh, reinforcement. And it's imaginable that if it had gone particularly badly, you might have decided to change course in the middle. And that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world either. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it, it turned out with the second kid that was much easier. So it was uh, it was easier to follow through. Uh, let's talk about an area that that. Some parents are very um, – struggle with a lot. Others don't struggle at all, but it it does engender a lot of controversy, which is vaccines. Uh, what do we know about them and how effective is that – How what's the quality of that evidence? Yeah, so, um, so vaccines are safe and effective. Um, I, uh, I spend a lot of time actually thinking just about how to talk about this in the book because I think that – uh, this has become such a, a controversial topic, uh, and I, you know, I pretty firmly believe in in vaccination. Um, but I think that it is a mistake to just dismiss uh, people who don't believe in vaccines as crazy lunatics, which I think is sometimes the the attitude of the sort of pro vaccination uh, community. And so. Actually, what I did in constructing that chapter was I went into there's a there's an Institute of Medicine report, which is like a thousand pages long, and it goes through all of the data on links between vaccines and adverse outcomes. Uh, and I really I tried to read it. I mean, I did read it. It was long. Um, and I, I tried to actually sort of drill into what are some of the the 
actual risks of vaccines that are identified in this like very carefully constructed report and what are the things that are that are not risks and so you know one of the things that comes out there is like there are many things for which we don't have data you know there are many things people have suggested are as risks of vaccines where there's simply no evidence that that would be a risk but also no evidence that it wouldn't be a risk it's just there just isn't any evidence or reason to think it's a risk. Um, and then there are a few things where, you know, there are risks of vaccines. These are either very, 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 very unlikely, like in the space of there have been three episodes of something and it is only a risk for immune compromised children. Like that's that's an example of something or they are pretty minor. So um, so some kids get a fever after uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. That's, that's a, you know, reasonably common, um, but also not something to, to worry about. And then you can also go through some of the evidence on some of the things that get cited more frequently, like links between autism and, uh, and vaccines, where there's just simply no evidence that vaccines cause cause autism. Um, so well, I, there is not, evidence. You don't think it's for, it's not no, reliable. There is there is tons of evidence that vaccines do not cause autism. Correct. <laughs> Huge amounts of evidence that vaccines do not cause autism. That is very well supported. There is a a discredited paper that has been retracted, which was the sort of original source of that yeah. of that link. There's no, I mean that that we is did an a, episode on that. that. I'll put a link to yeah. that. Um, so you know, I think that that people should should vaccinate their their kids. I think you know, one, some of my research is kind of a, more about the question of why people don't. This isn't really in the book, but just sort of thinking about what are some of the ways that that we could encourage uh, that we could encourage vaccines, given that the evidence sort of strongly supports them, and that like we're actually have sort of gotten into a position now where for some things like measles, actually the vaccination rates are so low in some areas that there are real risks of, of outbreaks. I mean, we're having, we're in currently in the middle of a quite a large vac measles outbreak um, because people haven't vaccinated, not enough people. And therefore? And therefore people get measles. No, but and therefore you recommend, you think that, that I, I the recommend costs people are, vac People are, should vaccine, vaccinate their children. I recommend you vaccinate your children. So, uh, by the way, you said it was like a thousand pages long. It was like a thousand pages long. It, it's yes. not like long. It's like a thousand. It's like right. nine something, right? It's, yes, 980 pages. <laughs> Which, of course, doesn't make it true. We should be careful. But, but no. it, you're thinking it was thorough. It's thorough. I mean, I think that sometimes in these debates about vaccines, you get the, the feeling that people think the CDC is just standing on one side being like, oh, it's fine. Trust us. We're experts. And then the, the anti-vaccination side can see more evidence based because they're saying, oh, look at these papers. Look at these. Look at this evidence that that we have come up with. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's not right. I mean, the the conclusions that the CDC is drawing and that these these American Academy of Pediatrics is is drawing from these are really carefully researched. I mean, this this is a thousand pages, which reflects, you know, reviews of of thousands and thousands of studies by many, many, many people over a period of many years. And they, the conclusion is vaccines are safe and effective, but it's not just something people are saying. It is something that we have evidence for. So I'm just going to add a, a philosophical thought, which is that it's very hard to be uh, cold and calculating about our children. It's very hard to be data-driven. Uh, we have lots of fears <laughs> That, that haunt us, uh, worries, anxieties, concerns. And, you know, it feels like life or death. Um, you know, anything from, uh, I'm just trying to get in, my own, in our own raising of our children, uh, you know, the time we ate some fish uh, when my wife was pregnant that we thought it was from a lake rather than the ocean and maybe it had more mercury. You know, those kind of worries yeah. uh, really keep you up at night. And I'm curious if in writing these two books and being forced to see and concede in some places, not all, but in some places, how uncertain the evidence is, did it cause you, has it caused you to become more cautious in how you interpret studies that are not quite so life and death <laughs> outside of, of the realm of child raising and, and pregnancy and, and stand, more standard areas of economics. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that this work in general has um, it's actually influenced my academic work a lot because I've started thinking a lot more about sort of issues of causality and how we um, like what kind of conclusions can we really draw uh, from from data and when um, you know how can we improve our ability to draw those to draw those kind of conclusions. But you know, I do think particularly in these in these realms of sort of parenting and and kind of choices people make about their health or the health of their uh of their their kids um the the evidence is often v- very limited and um and really not very good or you know not not as good as as you would like it and so i think that we're uh we're making a surprising number of of decisions based on evidence that isn't uh what we might hope that it would that it would be and sometimes i'm very i i wondered why isn't the evidence better? So going back to the question of breastfeeding, I said that there was like one randomized control trial. I continually wonder why is that? Like this is actually doesn't seem that difficult to run another trial with, you know, particularly in the US where breastfeeding rates are not super high. Um, and so you could imagine doing the same kind of study here. And I'm always sort of curious about why, why people haven't, haven't pursued that. So why, why isn't our data better than it is? I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm curious if it if this has made you more humble as an economist in terms of policy prescription. I think we all know that the less humble you are, the more attention you get. Uh, so humility is not rewarded in the marketplace of uh, competition among economists generally. But is it has it helped you in thinking about these issues? Has it helped you become more humble in your policy uh, confidence? Yeah, it's interesting. Um- that's, that's an interesting question. I probably, I mean, I think part of it is I've I've started working, and I think this may be may actually be something of of a reflection of what of what you're saying. I've I've sort of started working much more on things which are more or less just descriptive, rather than saying you know because of this causal relationship we should do X. Um, so I've become my work I think has become more sort of saying, look, here, here is an interesting relationship in the data that I think we could learn something from, um, which actually isn't as, as you point out, is not always as successful a kind of, uh, a kind of research because people like the sort of like, let's do X and yes, Y will do. happen. Um, but I think that, that, uh, that for many reasons of which the books are probably one of them, I have, I have moved into more of a, like, here's a really, here's something we see and what, what could we, what could we take from this? Um, We've had Brian Kaplan on the program, and Brian's a very vocal advocate for having children, uh, number one, which is not what your book's about. <laughs> but um, now you don't deal with the question of should or should you not. Right. But but uh, Brian also believes that one of the reasons you should have more children is that parenting is not very important. Uh, and, of course, as a parent, it's a lot of work. It's an immense amount of work. Uh, I'm, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to come back later and defend parenting as a general activity, but it is an enormous amount of work, and uh, it could discourage you from having a child. And Brian says, ah, don't be bothered by it. Whether you're good or bad, it doesn't really matter. The kids can turn out the way they're going to turn out regardless of what you do. And that would seem to be the kind of empirical question that would be almost impossible to answer. But Brian claims to answer it, and there are papers and, and authors who advocate for the uh, overwhelming uh, importance of uh, genetics and sort of obvious things that aren't much work, like not letting your kid near a hot stove or raging traffic or a exposed electrical outlet. And the rest of it's just not that important. All this stuff, breastfeeding, co-sleeping, yeah, forget about it. It's all fine. It's going to turn out okay. Uh, what's your view on that? So I think there's sort of two two pieces of that. I think to claim that sort of parenting and the kind of circumstances that people are raised in are not important for their outcomes, it belies a huge amount of social science about the importance of, uh, of circumstance to, to outcomes. I mean, I think that you, you don't need to look much past, you know, patterns of inequality and, and persistence in inequality uh, in the U.S. to think that it is a lot better to be born you know, the child of, of Brian Kaplan than, uh, you know, than a, a kid of a single mom on the, the south side of Chicago. I mean, that, I'm not this so just sure, like an Emily, miracle. I'm not so sure, Brian, <laughs> you maybe picked a bad example. No, I'm just teasing you, Brian. I feel uh, listening in. It's okay. 
Sorry, go ahead. Emma. Uh, but you know, so I, I think you know, if we if we just look at you know Raj Chetty's research on on this topic, it's hard to think that these kind of patterns of inequality don't have something to do with with circumstance. I I will say I think there's a sort of separate question, which is you know once you are a, you are sort of who you are. When we think about these more minor parenting choices, like it, like breastfeeding versus formula, or co-sleeping versus not, or um, you know, when do you potty train, or what kind of preschool do you choose, I I can more easily Im- imagine that those kind of choices do not uh, do not I- individually matter very much, um, and I think that that there is some evidence that you know some of which I cite in my book that most of these choices are not the most important thing uh, that you will that you will do. I think the, you know, the, the challenge is like, as a parent, you're going to make these choices and you want to make them in a way that you are happy with. So I think in, in some sense, I, I would say it, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter which choice you make, but it's not good if every choice you then feel like you didn't do it right. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the key here is to give people a way to think about these choices that they are that they are happy with because they feel like they've thought about them in a way that's kind of structured and, and organized uh, and that that ma- will make you happy and that that will make you a happy person and being a happy person is a good thing even if it isn't something that makes you a, a better a better parent so so that's kind of my my take on those on those pieces I think it might make you a better parent I, I don't think that's um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't discount that too much um, yeah, I agree I, I do think um, Anxiety is a very big challenge uh, of parenting and the insecurity and unease that modern parents have, I think, relative to our parents of the past uh, is is a fascinating thing in and of itself. Part of it's due to the fact that we have smaller families and part of it's due to the fact that we're probably wealthier and part of it's due to the fact that we have too much information that we don't know how to process. <laughs> and that last yeah. one is the one I think is the most interesting, but I, I want to move along. I one of the areas where you do come down pretty firmly on where the evidence lies is a fascinating story of economic and statistical detection, which is um, peanut allergies and the Bamba effect. Talk about that. Yeah. So this is like one of my favorite sort of examples uh, in in the book. So um, so there was a there were a series of studies. So peanut allergies have gone have gone up over time. Uh, in the sort of mid two thousands, there um, there was a guy in in the UK who wrote a paper in which he compared peanut allergies among kids in Israel to peanut allergies among Jewish kids in the UK. And he showed that basically the kids in Israel are way less likely to have, to have peanut allergies. And he attributed this, he sort of took the next step and he said, well, I think that's because they get early exposure to peanuts. So there's an Israeli peanut snack, which is like a very common early food for kids. It's called bamba. Uh, and so his, his idea was like, OK, this is because they eat peanuts early and the kids in the UK are advised to, to wait on peanuts. That, that's, that early exposure is why they're less likely to be allergic. Now, of course, as, as an economist, uh, you know, this it's like, ridiculous. The, I mean, cross country studies, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, this is like the 19, where are we like in the 1980s? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we're not into that. Um, but then, then they actually went a step further and they ran a randomized control trial in which they took kids, actually started with kids who were at, um, who were at higher risk for allergies in the first place. So they could have enough power, enough sample size in the, in the study. Uh, and they exposed some of them to, to peanuts, uh, to peanuts early and some of them to peanuts later. And they show that the kids with the early exposure are way less likely to develop allergies than the kids, um, than the kids with, uh, who didn't have exposure until, uh, until later. And that happened for even for kids who had initially a low risk of allergies, but also for kids who initially had a very high risk of allergies. And these effects in the study are, are like extremely big. So, uh, so for the kids who had sort of a high allergy risk initially, like they showed some peanut sensitivity, uh, the kids who, who did not get exposed, about a third of them ended up with a peanut allergy versus 10% in the group that had early, that had early exposure. So that's like a huge effect. Um, and of course, the thing that is like very d- disappointing about this in some ways is that people have been told not just, not that it's not just that they have been told, uh, that they have not been told to have early exposure, but actually the advice until very stay recently away. <laughs> was to stay away, which actually made this problem worse. So, you yeah. know, it's like and then many, many kids have peanut allergies now, many more than than in the past. And it may well be partly partly due to this 
basically this wrong advice. And then it turns out this actually is true of many other allergens. So, um, so the there are a few sort of key key things that people are allergic to: wheat, eggs, milk, uh, peanuts. At being sort of the main the main ones, and it turns out for most of those, there's now evidence that uh, that exposing exposing kids early is is good for preventing allergies. And of course, one has to be always careful. It could be this was a study sponsored by the Bomba Institute of Israel or the American Peanut Farmers Association. Um, you know, it, it it we should always be a little bit skeptical, but it does make some sense, which is good. It passes the sniff test that. The rising uh, growth in peanut allergies could be due to some environmental change, which is not eating peanuts when people are young. Um, and it, it goes back to, a, you know, a very um, interesting episode we had a long time ago uh, about um, the rise in autoimmune disorders and, and the question of whether we're too clean uh, or too hygienic, which would seem like a good thing. But if you don't develop those pathways in your body that keep you safe, um, maybe you should be eating more dirt when you're young or playing in the dirt yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I like my kids to eat a lot of dirt. Um, <laughs> but uh, there you go. Careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so no, I think, I mean, I think this is a, uh, I think there's an, the the sort of body of evidence now around this is is pretty compelling in favor of the, of the early peanut, uh, of the early peanut exposure. Yeah, that, that episode was the Moises uh, of Alaska's Manoff. Uh, which uh, which I which is interesting could be true. Uh, let's look at. Um, I just want to. I want to. Don't want to forget that the very first episode of Econ Talk, which was a little more than thirteen years ago, was on parenting uh, with Don Cox. It's called the Economics of Parenting. It's before we adopted the nomenclature of Don Cox on parenting, which is what it should be called. But uh, in that episode, Don uses economic principles. And it, the first part of that conversation, which is a mere 34 minutes, also before we start doing hour long, uh, Don explains why you should put your kid's coat on outside rather than inside because your kid's going to be cold. You're going to want to put your coat on. But one of the deal issues that you deal with in the book, of course, is the challenge of – you like that? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I do like that. <laughs> and snow pants too, he recommends. Yeah. Because uh, they're hard to get on and the kids kind of fight you. And, no, no, no it's true. I'm, I'm always having that argument with my children. I'm going to keep that in mind. Uh, so there's a general issue, of course, which is discipline and how to, to deal with kids who, strangely enough, don't always want to do, with, do what you want them to do. And uh, I thought this part of the book, though, probably not as scientific as some of the others, was fantastically great. So – uh, talk about what we know to the extent we know it about uh, discipline. Yeah, so so there are some. So I, this was actually, I will say, confess, this was not a part of the book I had intended to to have in um, because I don't know when I first sort of conceived of the book, I didn't I didn't think I would that science would have really any much to say about this. But my editor pushed me. She said, you know, look, I I I really want to know the answer to this. Can you please try to figure out if there's <laughs> anything about this? And if there is, we can put it in. And so, so it actually turns out there's there's more um, there's more science on this than than we might think. And and there what there are, are some randomized evaluations of a sort of particular kind of of discipline program. It has a lot of different names. So so one of them that's well known in the U.S. is one two three magic. There's something called positive parenting. These all have kind of the same principles, um, which are just that you should be very very consistent in in discipline. Um, and that when you discipline your kids, you have to remember that they are not adults. And I think this is the part that is in some ways uh, really challenging. Deep, deep revelation. but Deep revelation, think, yeah. You'd but think like, it wouldn't be, but it's, it's big. It, it is because <laughs> in the moment with your kid when they won't put on their snow pants, it's just like, wh what is the matter with you? It's cold outside. I can literally see the snow outside. Like, why are you not listening to me and putting your pants on? And, you know, you're sort of having this this reaction. I think that a lot of these are about looking as a parent, the first step in discipline is to step back and not get mad and not yell at your kids because that's that's not effective because who knows what's going on inside their head. It isn't that they're thinking it's snowing outside, therefore I must put on my snow pants, otherwise I will get wet. They're thinking something else. I don't want to put the snow pants on. It's hot in here. My foot is itching. Uh, who, I'm you know, hungry. Who I'm hungry. Like they're just, they're not an adult. And I think so. So these things all sort of start with the idea of just recognizing that your kid is, is not an adult and that also discussing it with them is not helpful. And so I think for me, that was actually a big, 
um, that was a that was a big revelation in reading in reading these things because my my kids are pretty verbal, and so there's the temptation to want to like explain to them dialogue have yeah have a negotiation. So can you tell me how you're feeling about the snow pants? Because the thing like but then it's like well what what does it matter what they're feeling about the snow pants? You got to put the snow pants on to go outside. And so these these discipline systems sort of emphasize kind of not getting angry. Uh, and then, and then also having a structured set of consequences for particularly bad behavior. So, so not so much for snow pants, but for things like, you know, um, don't put that thing in, don't, don't put that thing in your mouth. They do it or, anyway. Or say, in your brother's mouth. Or in your brother's <laughs> mouth. Or don't, don't pull your brother's hair or don't, you know, pinch him on the, on the, on the cheek that many times. Um, and sort of a, a structured set of consequences where you have, you know, warnings and then some consequence like, like a timeout. But in all of these things, you know, the, the main things they're emphasizing are consistency and not getting, and not getting mad that sort of adults should try not to get mad in the moment, which is of course, very easy to say when you're writing a parenting book and very difficult to do when you are actually (laughs) parenting. Um, but we can all, we can all aim towards that. Talk is cheap. Uh, but I think, I think the, what's fascinating to me is these principles, you don't need science for them. I think in the, in the cold light of, um, non-child day of your child not being in front of you, these are pretty obvious. Don't make a, don't make a threat. You can't, you're not going to follow up yes. on. Parents do it all the time. Uh, yeah. You know, no, I, I was, when I was writing this, I was then, I was like writing this and I was on an airplane and somebody behind me, hit, like the kid was kicking her, her kid was kicking the seat. She said, if you keep doing that, I'm going to leave you on the airplane. That is like a classic example yep. of a threat that you shouldn't make. You're, of course, you're not going to leave the kid on the airplane. Kid knows you know, it too. <laughs> and he kept kicking. She took him off the airplane, you know, and you've got to sort of – some of this is about thinking about are, are you willing to follow through on the threat that you're, that you're making? You know, if you're saying we're going to turn the car around, that's okay, but you've got to be willing to turn the car around. Um, so these, I think that's hard. So these rules, uh, which I wrote down from your book, don't discuss, don't get angry, clear consequences and consistency, they're kind of obvious, uh, in, again, in the abstract, but in the – in the moment, they're a little bit harder to implement, uh, and I think that's fascinating. I think one of the challenges of non-negotiation is that I think we believe often, perhaps correctly, but probably not, that if we talk it out with our child, they'll become smarter. They'll learn that it's cold outside and that they can get sick And at the age of two, two and a half. And, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, to bring Don Cox back into the picture, he had to deal with his kid. That when the kid said why, which seems like a great question, you know, for a parental dictum, uh, Don would say, well, I'll tell you why, but I want to make it clear from the start that it's not going to change what we do. <laughs> and the kid would go, yeah, OK, whatever. They, they lose interest. <laughs> it's, not an educa- it's not an educational moment for them. It's, a, it's just a, it's a strategy. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Let's, let's talk about something uh, dear to my heart, which is reading. Uh, we... I have a a joke that before I got married, I would read a book a week. Before I had children, I would read a book a week. And after I had children, I would read a book a night. But it had a lot more pictures. <laughs> uh, and, of course, after a while, I was reading two or three books a night with a lot of pictures. Yes. Um, and we believed it was a wonderful experience. Um, it was, a, it was a, a rule that was hardly if ever broken. Uh, we always read a book to our kids before they went to bed. And I suspect, deep, even though we loved it, uh, there were times when, for my wife, for example, Curious George was not her choice, and she was stuck with it, and I would maybe come in and help her. Um, or she'd just push through and read it, even though she didn't love it, because I think deep down she thought, reading to our kids is good. Uh, is it true? Yeah, I, I think the the evidence would suggest yes. I mean, this is a this is a place where it's, it's really hard to to learn all that we would like to from from the data because reading to your kids is really heavily associated with other kinds of other kinds of features of parents like education or income which also have good um, have have good outcomes or have associations rather with good outcomes and so 
but you know, I think that there is some, there is kind of some evidence around this, um, the, the value of reading, some of which comes from sort of utilizing differences in spacing between kids and looking at sort of first kids where there's more space uh, before their younger sibling is born. So there's sort of more concentrated parenting time. And one of the things that happens if you have more time with just one kid is you read to them more. And that does seem to have some, um, have some positive impacts on uh, on on like reading readiness um, and and reading performance later. There's also some kind of neat. I mean, I wouldn't describe this exactly as um, as evidence in favor of reading, but there's some interesting uh, some interesting science like fMRI research where they've put kids in um, where they put kids in fMRI machines and they image their they image their brains when they when they read to them. And so this uh, so what they find in this particular very small study is that kids who have more reading at home, when they are read to in the machine, uh, there's kind of more activation in parts of the brain that's associated with imagery. So it sort of seems like maybe they're having an easier, they're like having more of an experience of kind of seeing the book. Um, again, that's like one of these like, oh, that's interesting facts as opposed to something that says you have to read to your to your kid. But yeah. it does look like reading is mattering, um, is, is mattering some up to the limitations of the data, which are very real in this case. Yeah, I think the main reason to read your kid is you enjoy it. Is it's fun, exactly. And if you don't, yeah. you're probably not going to help them much. But um, it it is a, um, it's to some extent a matter of taste. Having said that, uh, I think the more interesting question would be whether it builds a taste for reading. And, you know, I just, I like to think it does. I, I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. It's really I hard mean, to measure. Um for me, like I love books so much that yeah. it was it was always something where it's just like I want to be reading to my kids because this is something that I that I like and you know I like to do and like I now that my daughter is old enough to read stuff that I that I really enjoy reading it's it's even more it's sort of even more fun to get to do it so for me that was most of the motivation was just that it was it that it was fun and it was something we could do together that I that I enjoyed more than some things like building with Legos, yeah, which and, is never my, not my taste. <laughs> and it's something you share for the rest of your life, uh, which I don't build that many Lego um, <laughs> stuff with my post-adolescent, you know, college-age kids. It's just maybe down the road. But uh, maybe. we talk about books pretty often, which is really fun. Um, just just a consumption good. We like to think it's an investment good. But um, I, So I'm going to ask you about something that's um, – a little bit, again, metaphysical, maybe, uh, philosophical. I got into a really interesting conversation on Twitter with Julia Gallif, who is the uh, host of a podcast, Rationally Speaking. And she said, you know what we need? We need, I hope I'm doing her justice here. I think this is what she said, something like this. We need 10,000 people who are thinking of having kids and we'll follow them over the next 20 years. And some of them will and some of them won't. And we'll interview them and find out whether they were glad with, happy with what they did. And I suggest that that was not a good strategy um, for a bunch of reasons, and this engendered an enormous um, argument on Twitter between people who thought, well, some better – okay, sure, it's a flaw. It would be a flawed study, but some data is better than nothing, and my view is often that no, it's not. It actually leads you to think that you know something you actually have no idea about, and when I think about the question of whether to have children, which you touch on indirectly when you talk about its effects on marriage, which is a very interesting chapter – but when I think of the question of whether to have children, uh, I don't think about it as a cost-benefit analysis. I never did. Uh, I still don't, and I don't recommend that people do that. Uh, for starters, you're a different person after you have children than when before. So it's really hard to know how to wait what somebody says after they've had children. Um, they're not like you. They're at a different part in their stage in their life. Happiness isn't the only thing I care about. Um, I'm not sure what to do with the self-reported number. There's just so many things that I look at that. And I, for me, the reason to have children, it's extremely enormous part of the human experience, period. And you should, if you can, unless you have strong reasons to not do it, which you could for all kinds of emotional or physical reasons, it's something to experience because it's part of being human. So that's my simple argument. I don't use data. Uh, I, you know, I could invoke some. Uh, I suspect that if you survey most parents, they're glad they had children, but I don't put much weight in that. And if they said they didn't, I wouldn't put much weight in that either. What are your thoughts on that general question of those kind of big issues and uh, in that particular one? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, it's very, I think, so I'm, I'm with you on this sort of first question of, of could we learn much from, uh, from a study which compared people who had kids to people, people who don't because that choice is so, uh, is, is sort of so endogenous and so carefully thought out. I'm not sure that we would, that we would, um, that we would learn much there. I mean, I think, you know, the, the experience of having children is, is so varied and, and I think ha- happiness is such a funny way to think about it. I mean, we see these studies where you sort of ask people, are you happy like in the moment? And a lot of times in the moment of being with, with their kids, they're not necessarily that happy, particularly with little kids, because it can be tiring and frustrating. And, you know, when you're trying to get them to put their snow pants on, it's not like the best part of your day always. Um, but then when you ask people about sort of the experience of having of having kids, most people with kids will tell you like, you know, this is the best thing that I, um, that I, do. And so, you know, I, I do think it's, it's hard to just hard to, I mean, I find happiness in general is a hard thing to think about and particularly around, uh, around your kids where it's, it's so like, once you have the kids, as you say, you're sort of a different person and there's all of a sudden this part of you that is so much more important than anything else that you, that you are doing anything else that you're, that you're experiencing. It's hard to, it's just hard. It's hard to think about how you would ask well, what would I feel like if I didn't, if I didn't have them? Once you have them, that's a totally different question than if you, if you sort of don't have any yet. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think about the fact that I'll never forget this after we had our first child, uh, I'm at the movies and it's a different experience. <laughs> and, and I don't mean because I'm worried about, you know, the babysitter or in this case, I think the kid was sleeping, uh, while nursing with my wife in the theater, I think, you know, she was probably, you know, six weeks old and we were out for the first time. Oh my God, I can't believe you went to a movie. I don't think I've been to a movie in like nine years. No, you okay, don't. Go, you know, and, and it took us a while to figure this out, by the way. Uh, it's that if you're going to get a babysitter, you better at least go to a show. Uh, because right. it's, it's what's the point? You can watch a movie in your too, house. It is not as good, but it's close enough that the babysitter thing, of course, is getting out. It's complicated, but still. <laughs> Um, but you're a different person. It's not just that you have something you care about. Your whole, your head becomes different. And it's a scary thing. I understand why people um, struggle to to make the leap. Um, there's a video that um, I think Scratch Rubin made that's really absolutely beautiful called uh, The Days Are Long and the Years Are Short. Mm-hmm. The people, parents tell you, and I, I hate this, this parenting um, uh, remark. Oh, it goes by so quickly. And when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't. It does not <laughs> it, feel like that. No, no. no it does it, not go by it, that quickly. It's eternal. Uh, that night of, that first night of crying is not going quickly. It's, it's unimaginably long. And yet there's this weird paradox that the days are long, uh, but the years do go by somewhat quickly, um, which says to, you should savor them. Uh, if you were a parent, you should uh, notice them and try to be present for the, Again, that human experience, not because your kid's going to be happier, richer, or more successful, or more adjusted. It just, it's just part of life, and you should be there for it. I totally agree. Could not have said it better. Uh, close with what you close with in your book, which is the best parenting advice you ever received, which um, I don't think I, ha- I, I, I want to, I'll give mine, if I may first. Yes. Um, which is, I don't know if it's good advice, but it's one that I held, my wife and I tried to hold to, which is that. The main reason to have your children be well-behaved and to provide some discipline is that you'll like them more and that if you let them become um, the alternative, uh, you'll struggle to like them. Uh, if you make them disciplined and well-behaved, not not robots, not, not creepily um, polite, but just not animals, uh, your friends will like them too, which is just – which is a bonus. But the most important thing is that – You'll enjoy their company, and you'll be a better parent. Uh, there's a selfish bootlegger and Baptist thing that working on there that I have to con- confess, but it did color our uh, the way we raised our kids. And uh, if I had to say one thing, that would be it. I don't know if it's the best, but it was a good thing, I think. I like that. So mine, okay, so mine in, in the book is from our, our really wonderful first pediatrician, Dr. Lee. And so um, so as has probably come across here, I'm a somewhat neurotic parent. Uh, and so we were, my daughter was two, two and we were going on this vacation and the place we were going on the vacation was, had, had some bees. It's a place with bees, I mean, not like 
a million bees, but there are bees there. And she had never been stung. And so we went to this well visit and, and I sort of outlined this detailed, uh, elaborate scenario about the bees. Like if she gets stung, what, and then we're kind of far from things. Like, I don't know where the hospital is. You know, what, what should we do about this? What if she's allergic? And, you know, should I have an EpiPen? Should we do something in advance? To, you know, for, and she just sort of looked at me. She kind of paused a minute and she said, hmm, I'd, I'd probably try just not to think about that. And I was like, oh, okay. And it was sort of, it showed, it was great because it both was, of course, exactly the right advice, but also showed a tremendous amount of knowledge of what kind of person I was. That, you know, <laughs> that she really wasn't, Dr. Lee didn't really need to engage with this. She was just like, you know what? Just don't think about that and it'll probably be fine. And then indeed, you know, Penelope did not get stung. And then uh, several years later, she did get stung and it was fine. Um, I mean, she she didn't enjoy it, but everything turned out fine. So I think that, you know, for me, that that kind of, it encapsulated a little bit the the sort of like sometimes you just you just can't think about it because it's probably going to be fine and you can't obsess about every like tiny little thing. Sometimes you just gotta gotta let it go. My guest today has been Emily Oster. Her book is Crib Sheet. Emily, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.